Frida Brenner was 16 years old one day in June of 1941 when her and her friends from the building and really from the neighborhood all went to school um, to get their grades for the year. When they got to school, they saw a lot of other young kids, this was a high school, assembled in the courtyard of the building and they joined them and the principal of the school came out on the balcony to address the assembled students. He said to them, students, the Germans have begun their assault on Lvov. You cannot go home, you cannot return. We have buses that are gonna take us across the border into the Soviet Union. The buses came and loaded up all the students but they were unable to take them all the way to the border because already the roads had been bombed. So they dropped the students off and instructed them to run as fast as they could. As they ran, some of the students were in sandals and summer clothing, and they discovered that they couldn't run very quickly, so the students all took off their shoes. Someone had a big bag and they placed it, all their shoes in the bag and they ran along the roads and they alternated who was carrying the big bag of shoes over their shoulder. And before too long, uh, the German planes came down low and started strafing the, the road of the running students. And by evening, they'd all become separated from each other, forming into small groups as they made their way to try to cross over to the, beyond to the other side, the Soviet lines. So that was my grandmother among them. Um, she ended up surviving the war, made her way all the way to Uzbekistan because um, in her school, in her high school, they had shown the students what turned out to be a propaganda film that was not very historically accurate called Tashkent City of Bread. And as they were starving in Moscow, they decided to go to the City of Bread, which turned out to just be a desert where nothing grew but cotton. It was a displaced persons camp there. There were camps there, but uh, she didn't live in a camp. She ended up working as a cotton driver and then as a um, manager uh, of other cotton drivers who were picking up tr trucks full of cotton from the fields. Um, I, I, I bring her up because I think many of us know that uh, our families struggled through a different time and a different era to ensure that we would be here today. They each faced their own struggles, their own challenges, their own uh, pop marked roads as they struggled to find a way to survive. I think that in many cases, those histories are yet to be uncovered. And this is one of the things that is the most exciting to me about tonight's speaker, Barbara Rothman's book. It has been a trend recently um, to write books that trace what we call micro histories. One family, one small unit. Um, Daniel Mendelssohn wrote a book recently called The Search for Six Among the Six Million. That was his his small family's travels. And it's addressing a trend that we all see coming where the big number, six million, it's very hard for us to register. And the Holocaust, like other genocides, isn't experienced as a collective trauma. Although it did happen around other people. They, six million weren't murdered. One individual was murdered and that act was repeated six million times. But it's each individual story that helps shape and tell the story and fill in the details as we look back on that history of not just those who perished, but those who survived and went on to form new families and new lives. So I'm very glad that we can host this book talk for Barbara's new book. It's a very exciting volume. And uh, here to introduce tonight's speaker is Kitty Bateman, that many of you know, and all of you will know very shortly. Um, 
She is a longtime professor here at Queensborough Community College and um, an inspirational figure in her own right. So please join me in welcoming Kitty Bateman. And thank you uh, to Dr. Daniel Lesham, who's the new director of the Kupferberg Holocaust Center and Archive, uh, who just joined us from USC. So he's, he's the new guy in town, and you should all know who he is. And let me just give you a little bit of an overview. I will um, introduce the book. Um, Barbara will give a talk. There will be questions and answers after the talk. And there are a limited number of um, boutique publication uh, copies of the book uh, if you want to purchase them afterwards. And I want you to know that the proceeds will be donated to the Kupferberg Holocaust Research Center and Archive. So if you're interested in that, we will we'll be over here after the presentation. And um, Barbara generously asked me to write the foreword to her book. And um, I did. And I'm going to read it to you today. And I hope it sets the stage for the presentation. <clears throat> I have been a colleague and friend of Barbara Rothman's for almost 40 years. And it is a great honor to be able to write a foreword to this document. Barbara has brought her considerable strengths and passion to a project which holds profound meaning for her and for members of her family. The voyage she has embarked upon to create this work has, I am certain, taken her to many unexpected places. Most poignant was her visit in the spring of 2012 to Poland, the home of her father, aunt, and numerous other members of her immediate family. These experiences heightened her resolve to complete the work necessary for this document. It is a tribute to her and to her family, and the one which I am certain will resonate with all of you whose families were caught up in the horrors of the Holocaust. And with that, I'd like you to introduce our speaker of the night, Barbara Rothman. Thank you, Kitty. Welcome, Barbara. It's, it's wonderful to see everyone here. It's wonderful to have um, such a lovely friend as Kitty to introduce me. And I thank you all for coming. I know it's not easy, especially with the traffic on the Long Island Railroad. Uh, I, I, and also the Long Island Expressway. So um, some of you are already asking questions. And I'd like to tell you uh, about my book. And my book is called No Road for Me to Africa. And the title comes from a, a, a sentence in a letter that my uncle wrote uh, when he, his sister had already gone to South Africa and he missed her and he wanted to know how she was and he said, please let me know how you are. I want to hear from you and um, if I could, I would go there to see for myself how you are but there is no road for me to Africa. And I like that saying and I also uh, there's also a second meaning to it because he did never get out. There was no road for him anywhere. Uh, and um, I put him on the cover because he's very handsome. And I like the way he's looking straight at the camera. His name is Felic. He's the youngest member of my father's family. And he was also a hero. Uh, because of his actions, the family was able to stay together and stay longer in the uh, ghetto and that helped them. So I'm going to move along now and I'm going to tell you why I wrote the book. And I never imagined that I would write a book about my family. And then after I wrote this I thought, well, why didn't you ever aspire to be an author? And then I thought, well, you aspire to be other things. I aspired to be a journalist. I went to see uh, Eileen Ford at the modeling agency. <laughs> so I did have high aspirations. But I became a teacher. Anyway, the teaching helped me in this uh, event because 
this was a very big project. What happened was that um, I came into possession of the family letters through a series of events. The uh, main event is that uh, my aunt died a number of years ago, about six or seven years ago. She was 100 years old. By then, she was living in New Zealand. She had moved from South Africa to Australia to New Zealand. And I had met her many, many years ago in the 60s when she came to visit my father. And she came with her young daughter. And my, her, her daughter was 15 at the time. It was a very big trip. And I entertained them. And uh, I sent condolences. And my cousin said to me, well, I found all these uh, papers. And would you like to see them? Well, I said, fine. But how will I see them? And Lillian said, well, I have a new machine. It's called a scan machine. And I'm very good at it. So I said, fine. So she started scanning them to me. And um, the process by which the letters became translated was a long, windy process. And my first translator is here. Uh, thank you for coming. And we started with just uh, the words. And I thought I'd see how good my Yiddish was. And then there was another translator when this translator moved away. And uh, eventually, I had three Yiddish translators and one Polish translator. And the, um, <coughs> the uh, process uh, accelerated itself when a Polish woman came into my home, uh, ostensibly to help me after my husband had some surgery. And she came ostensibly to do some cleaning and help and whatever. But she was a student. And she was here to learn English. And as soon as she looked at the letters, she could read them immediately. And she saw that she lived exactly. Also, her family lived on the same street. Her aunt had, and she said, Jabowska Street. And then when she started translating the Polish and these letters started coming from Europe, it became very en engaging. And I became really uh, immersed in the project. So um, needless to say, it had a big, a big uh, impact on my life. And then still, uh, no matter how much I almost had, everything was almost translated. And it still was a jumble. Because when Lillian sent the letters in the scan machine, where if you open up a four-page letter, you get page one and page four. And then if you turn it over, you get page two and page three. And then the Yiddish was written from right to left, and the Polish was written from left to right. And sometimes two or three people were writing. And there was a date on page one, a date on page four. And, it was, and sometimes it looked like a complete letter. Anyway, I asked Lillian. And one day, I will never forget, the doorbell rang. I was in Florida. And the FedEx man came with a padded envelope. And Lillian had just decided she sent me all the originals. Then I became the custodian. Once I had these letters, I had to go back to my second translator and piece it all together to see what I had, what went with what. And then after that, I had to first put the whole uh, story together. So it was a long process. That took about a good four years. So now I'd like to tell you that I also read a couple of books during this time that influenced me. One was The Hair with the Amber Eyes. Um, and that book, oh, I got the wrong one. These are a little jumpy. No, so OK, we're at the right one. I may have some technical difficulty, but I hope you'll bear with me. So anyway, um, in The Hair with the Amber Eyes, I, I, when I started to put it together, I thought, well, what can I write? Uh, this author was tracing his family's net skis, uh, Japanese buttons. And he was very personal. And I thought, well, I can be personal also, because I can respond. And then I read another uh, book called The Garden of Evil. And I had been doing a lot of research, because if they mentioned Czechoslovakia, I had to look up a timeline on Czechoslovakia. If they mentioned something else, I had to look that up. And uh, eventually, uh, some of those uh, videos were hard to watch. So I went to the more pleasant videos. I went to Warsaw, pre-war Warsaw. I saw they had tango music. I saw they had Art Deco paintings. 
And um, I'd like to put you in the world of pre-war Warsaw because I learned a lot about the city and it was very intriguing. So I'm going to show you two brief videos um, and one is going to be about the architecture of Warsaw and then the next one is going to be about the nightlife in Warsaw. And they're not going to take a long time, but maybe they'll entertain you a little bit also. And these are probably old postcards, but you can see the buildings, you can see the streets, and you can see how beautiful it was. Didn't do this at home. This is a synagogue. Hi, Rivka. Come on in. This street is called Marshakovska. It was a big shopping street. Look at that building. I don't know why it's cracking, so. The street is sort of like Madison Avenue. It's called Noe Sweat Street. It goes down to the old town. Well, I don't know how to fix the cracking except to <laughs> jump up and down here. <laughs> okay, we'll try another one. The next one I want to show you has to do with the cafes and the nightlife. And uh, uh, also, uh, this is a tango. It's called, um, it's called uh, You Have No Heart, and there's a Jewish composer. And uh, I'll play a little bit of it for you. I sort of fell in love with the tango music. And here she's sitting with a telephone 
before cell phones were invented. She manages to make a call during lunch. I know it's skiing, but I don't know why they call it golf. So I want you to see the um, Art Deco in the graphic arts as well. And I had a few more, but I couldn't put them in. And I, I have a list uh, on the paper outside for some other videos that you can watch when you can't sleep at night. So. <laughs> Now I'd like to go uh, and tell you a little bit about my family who lived in this beautiful uh, town. And you can see I'm skipping some. And now that I put you in the mood for Warsaw, I'm going to tell you that my family did not originate in Warsaw. They came from a town called Radzin. Now Radzin was 76 miles east, northeast of Warsaw. And, um, and there were a lot of uh, family members. And this is a 1929 telephone book. And down there in the lower right, I'm not going to try to point to it because I, 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 it's down here, OK? And it says in Polish, Taylor, and it's in French. Uh, it's translated into Taylor's, which was the uh, international language then. And um, so my family. Uh, my father's father and mother moved from Warsaw, from uh, Radzin to Warsaw, and then they had uh, a, a large family. They were the only ones to move, and so there were still a lot of people back in Radzin. So I made this tree so that uh, you can figure out who is who, because there are a lot of players uh, in this drama. And uh, the, the girls are in pink, and I put the men in yellow. And uh, the uh, primary family are my grandmother, Leah, and my grandfather, David. Here's Leah and David. And they had six children. Girl, boy, girl, boy, girl, boy. And uh, these uh, little figures here are David's family, the ones that were still back in Radzin. And they were named Moshe, and Moshe wrote a postcard uh, that's in my book, and Avraham and Temienta, and Yankel Yiddel, and Sarah. And Sarah died very young, in, probably in childbirth, because she had a lot of children. And one of her daughters, named Rachel, raised the children. And when uh, uh, her older sister, Ida, had already gone to South Africa. When she came of age, she and her husband moved to South Africa as well. Additionally, their brother moved to South Africa. So these are brothers and sisters of David. And what happened was Morris was in South Africa alone. He was a bachelor. And he had seen my Aunt Eva in Radzin, and he liked her, and he wanted to get a wife. So he wrote, these people uh, wrote to my grandfather, suggesting that Eva come and come to Radzin. And it, it was agreed upon. Now, this slide will come back to a lot, because I, don't, I want you to remember who we're going to talk about.
Now, in 1938, when this story begins, Lee and David's children, they were all young adults. They were ages 18 through their mid-30s. And so there are a lot of love stories um, in this uh, here, in this story. Now, one of the things I already touched upon, which was pre-war Warsaw, I'm also going to talk upon about my family and four women, four women in the family specifically. And I'm going to talk, talk about love and survival. And there's a lot of love here. So uh, also I'm going to talk about the letters themselves. Now, the children's future lives, hopes, and dreams were all ahead of them. And their letters are peppered with hopes for immigration. Some have left, some can't leave, some want to get married, some don't. And they had a lot of optimism, the younger people. And pretty much my grandfather also had optimism because no one knew what was coming. It really just came upon them. When you read the letters and you see that just before they're being invaded, they're sending bedspreads and drapes and things, uh, they, ha they really didn't know what, what, what they were in for. So they kept in touch with their brother in New York and their sister in Johannesburg through these letters, staying close with news and feelings, help in furnishings, advice, and especially sending their love to each other. Now, to go back to this, too loud? No, not, not loud enough. OK, to go back to this, in 1938, I'm just going to go briefly through what happened to each person. Edith, uh, the oldest daughter, survives in Russia with her husband and son. Julius, in 1938, he's already gone. My father's already in New York with his wife. He's out of the picture. Eva is going to go on a train. She's going to go on a boat. And she's going to go to Morris. And she is the one who kept all these letters. Suchim is the one we know the least about. He's a young man. He goes to Bialystok. He goes to the Russian side. He works there. And he, he disappears. Apparently, he gets killed there. We only have one picture, one photo of him. Danka, my aunt, she survives. She survives Auschwitz. And um, she goes to South Africa, where her sister Eva was and makes a life there. Felic, you've already met him. He's on the cover of the book, the youngest one. He has a girlfriend. Her name is Gutta. And we're going to talk about in, in, in detail the three women and Gutta, because Gutta is very important. And also, another cousin comes along, and these three women are the only ones who survive. Gutta, Danka, and Dora. So let's just move along now. And we're going to start with Eva. Now we're going to start with Eva, because without Eva, there wouldn't be any story. There wouldn't be a book. She was not the prettiest. She was the only daughter to uh, emigrate to uh, another country. Here she is in the street with my grandfather. You can see she's dressed nicely. Everyone in my family was dressed nicely, because that's the business they were in. And my grandfather is here, and this is Eva. So. She uh, departs to South Africa for this arranged marriage. And she has a really hard time when she gets there. You saw how sophisticated Warsaw was. And I don't think Johannesburg was anything like that. Also, she has no idea what her husband-to-be looks like. Because one of the sisters says, what does he look like? <laughs> Have you met him? And a lot of the letters say, be happy. <laughs> and. Please don't miss us as much as we miss you. And we wish you this, we wish you that. Anyway, she does. So she's very homesick, and they are very upset also. There's a wrench after they leave. Uh, my grandfather says, I, I, I dreamed of your arrival like you were a movie star. And she didn't feel that way when she got there. But he's upset, and they're all upset. Anyway. Later on, she adjusts, and she gets married there. And she helps my, the family during the war once the Nazis come and once they're in the ghetto, as does my father. Mostly, she tries to send money. But most of the times, the letters say, we didn't get the money. Who did you send it with? Uh, and she helps her sister after the war. And South Africa became her home. Uh, unfortunately, when she became very South African. 
uh, and uh, <clears throat> she was shocked when she came to the United States that she had to go on the bus by herself and other things. But I'm really proud of Eva because she kept the, um, the letters. So they must have been a treasure to her because she kept them. And here she is, here's her immigration card when she gets into South Africa. Here she is on the beach with her son, her oldest, uh, she has a son and a daughter. And here's a picture of my Aunt Danka. This must have been in the early um, 50s, uh, and uh, Danka obviously is not married yet. So we're going to talk about another woman. And uh, should I go back to, uh, let me just go back to, well, she's the oldest one. So she is very delicate and very refined, very pretty. My father was the closest to her because they were the closest in age. And this is uh, Edith in, this, in, in, in the park wearing a little, a little fur coat. And she's very delicate. She's very refined. And uh, she is uh, uh, married. She's the only person who's married. Uh, she has a husband named Henyuk. He was a little on the rough side. My family wasn't so sure he was exactly right for her. And also she has a little boy. His name is Bullock. And Bullock is the apple of everyone's eye. There are pictures of him in the park wearing little fur jackets and he's just adorable. He turns out to be the um, only grandchild that my grandparents ever knew and he's the only one born in Poland. Unfortunately, a life became very hard for him, and now he lives in Germany. Um, he was very much affected by the war. So Henyuk really wants to take, get out, and there's a letter from him to Eva asking about immigration. It's impossible. He gets a wagon. He takes his wife and his child, and they go in the wagon to Russia. They live in the woods for a while. They eat animals, and then eventually they wind up in Siberia, and they get into a labor camp, and that's where they spend the war. Now, in Siberia, they have a daughter, my cousin Shirley. Some of you have heard me talk about her. And on the right side, you can see Shirley, who was born in the, in the, in the labor camp, um, and she's very pretty. And she must be a toddler here, about 13 or 14 months old, and he must be now about, oh, 11 because they're 10 years apart. And here she is in the DP camp. She's about three or four there. And uh, eventually the family settles in Canada. They have a little bit of a difficult time because they want to come to America. My father can't get them in. They go to Canada, then they go to South Africa, then it's not good in South Africa, then they go back to Canada. So they, they, they had a hard, uh, uh, they didn't settle right away. Anyway, um, the next person we're going to talk about is Danka. And Danka is the youngest daughter. She's very pretty. She's a fashionista. She has blonde hair, blue eyes. She's very charming. She's very coquettish. And I think she's sort of a cross between Greta Garbo and Scarlett Johansson. So here she is. This is her with a girlfriend. Her friend's name is Regina. She has lots of friends, lots of boyfriends. Um, she's just very, very lively. And she could not immigrate. She could not get out. She got caught in the war. She survived the ghetto. She survived the small ghetto. And I'll explain to you what the small ghetto was. Uh, it's where they took everybody to work in factories. Um, and so they called it the small ghetto after 1942. She survived Maidanek and she survived Auschwitz. Now her story is very interesting because when she got to Auschwitz, when the three of them got to Auschwitz, three women got to Auschwitz, uh, five of them left the uh, Warsaw uh, at the end of the uprising. And the uprising happened in 1943 uh, after they took a lot of people away and the young people had nobody left. They had no grandparents. They didn't have anything to lose anymore. So they got guns. It lasted about six weeks. It was really very dramatic. I had no idea about this before I read this. And by now, my family was living in, um, in, in, in this smaller ghetto, uh, which came into being after 1942, when they had a huge deportations. 
So when she got to the platform, Mengele was there, and he took one look at her, and he asked her, do you like shoes? Oh, well, she must have said yes, because then she got a job indoors sorting shoes. So that was her favorite position, and that was because of her looks. So she was very determined uh, to survive, and uh, during the death march, she jumped into a ditch. Uh, she jumped out of windows before, and uh, some Polish women said, no, you can't jump with us. She couldn't walk anymore, but she did. And then after the war, she went from uh, she went from Poland, she went all the way to Russia to see her sister. She told her sister she was going to South Africa. She went all the way back into Europe. She went up to Scandinavia somewhere. Her sister must have sent her some money. She got on a boat. She went all the way to South Africa. Now, when she got to South Africa, she got a job. She learned English. She took elocution lessons. And she made a new life for herself there. She married three times, once in the ghetto, and I'll tell you that story in a second, and twice in South Africa. <coughs> now, here's her immigration card to South Africa, exactly 10 years after her sister Eva comes. But what a difference between 1938 and 1948. She was already in the ghetto. She was already in the concentration camps. Her life had changed. She was a different person. This is her second husband. His name is Arnold Benny, and she had two sons with him. And this is my cousin Dennis. He's a venture capitalist. He lives in Canada. So what happened is that uh, Danka, I'm going to read to you now from one of the letters. This letter is the letter of May 15th. Um, the book is divided into sections, uh, the summer when Eva leaves until the winter, and then the second part is the winter of 1939, the year has changed, until the spring. Now, times of getting rough, the letters uh, include things such as uh, things that they've been taking away from Jews, uh, they can't eat meat, their slaughterhouses are closing, people are being arrested, <laughs> Um, also, there are uh, hoarding, people are preparing for Passover, and so there's a lot of stress. Also, Czechoslovakia had been invaded, and they heard about it. In March, they were. So the letters are even more erratic, and Eva must be very upset. She says to them, you forgot about me. Where, why don't you write me? And so this letter, which I have here displayed, and I want you to look at the letters because I also have the originals on display because I think there's nothing quite like an original even though I scanned them into the book. But you can't see uh, how the bleeding through uh, of the ink comes from one side to another. So in this particular letter, three people are writing to one person. And Felic writes her and he says, um, he wants to calm her down, so he says, um, we got a letter from you, we're surprised we didn't get any more. Why you get them, I can't understand. Again, you're writing someone, send money, we didn't get any money. And he says, uh, one thing, Hitler won't get us. Hitler for sure won't get us, but what will be later, nobody knows. So now he thinks she needs a lot of things. She is kind of needy, Eva. So they're sending her things. They're sending her photography. Then he says, the cape we'll send this week with a sweater and a red scarf and a few more things. Mother says we should make you sofa covers and let us know if you need drapes. <laughs> now in three months they're gonna be invaded, okay? And my, my grandfather uh, is very upset because she's written uh, that you, what happened? You know, don't you love me anymore? So he writes, my dear child, you write that we have already forgotten about you. When you, my dear child, could look into our hearts every day and see how we long for you, you would see that you are missed in every corner and how there is no one to whom to pour out our hearts. And why don't you write again and we love you? And this part from Danka 
is the last piece of the letter that, of all the letters that was not translated. I even took it with me to Poland because I didn't have a Polish translator here. And she sent it back to me. And Eva, uh, Danka gets right to the point. She says, I really do not understand why you are angry with me. I write constantly and that the letters do not come is really sad and I do not know what will happen. I perfectly understand because I know how I, know how I feel. Not a day goes by when I return from work and the first I have to know is if there is a letter from you. I really cannot describe to you how happy your letters make us. Then she tries to comfort her. She says, dearest, do not worry. With us, it is all right. We are all well and somehow alive. The situation is now very tight, and we do not know how it will all end. And so we do not care, even in Poland. I will write you about it, the whole book. So she's funny, and now she changes the subject. She says, now I bought a light blue suit and new accessories. I no longer go on dates with Busatsky. Now I go on dates with Lopata's son. <laughs> I have, she has a lot, she's very uh, popular. I am sure you know him from Otwok. This is a very solid guy. He is very much in love with me. He received a few weeks ago the American papers and it would be nice if they had not closed. She says, I was ecstatically happy. She was happy to think that she was going. She says, and then I don't have any luck because apparently the papers, the, the, they couldn't get out. Now she says, he's trying to get, he wrote to an uncle in Australia and maybe he'll get papers from there. He would do anything for me, but well, she says, he is not my type. <laughs> Everybody likes him. If he would go to Australia, I would with pleasure go with him. The fact is she does marry him. She marries him. His name is Sigmund Lopata. There is one picture of him with them in the park. He looks like Tyrone Power. He's so handsome. And what happens is that, well, Gutze described the wedding to me, and Gutze is the next one we're going to talk about. Gutze said that she looked like Princess Diana. My family made her a pale lime green chemise dress, and she had a white fur, and that she was just magnificent. And Sigmund moves in with my family. He was a baker, and he stayed with the family. He worked in the factory. Felic taught him and taught everybody in the family how to work on fur machines, which is why they stayed longer in the ghetto. And he was a baker, and Felic taught him this skill so they could all remain together. And um, so you can see that Danka has a lot of personality. And one day uh, during the uprising, when they were hiding in the bunker, Sigmund got restless. He didn't want to stay anymore, and he went out ostensibly to fight, and he just disappeared. So she lost him, and then uh, at the end of the uh, uprising, General Stroop came in because the Germans were so shocked that these young people took guns and really were fighting them. So General Stroop came in and they tried to fight back the Germans, but the people were so hidden in their bunkers they couldn't get them out. So they turned off the water, the electricity, and they set fire to the buildings. And that, that's, my family was in that. By then there were five of them left because Sigmund had gone and my grandmother was gone, I'll tell you about that. And uh, five of them went to Maidanic. Now, if they had gone earlier, if they had gone in 1942, in, in the summer of 42, they probably would have gone to Treblinka. And they, um, two of them died in Maidanic. Maidanic is a camp that was near Lublin. And my grandfather didn't make it. Gutsu saw Felic, and he already told her that my grandfather was dead. And then I didn't know what happened to Felic, but I asked my grandmother, I asked Gutsu, and she said she thinks he got shot. So then the three women, there are five of them left, and three women went to Maidanic, and only three came out of Maidanic. So those three uh, went to Auschwitz, and they did wind up in Auschwitz. They survived. 
So now we're going to talk about Gutta. And Gutta is the last uh, woman I'm going to focus on. And Gutta uh, is still alive. She's terrific. She calls New York, she calls California, she calls Berlin. <laughs> she lives in Canada with her daughter. There's a chapter in the book called Gutta's Secret because this is a real love story because she lived with my family in the ghetto and the camps and she knew all the details of our life. And a few years ago, my cousin Shirley's daughter, who's a doctor, was marrying, it was a big wedding, and Gutta must have seen all of us together and she couldn't contain herself. So she started talking to Dennis and he said, okay, let's have brunch the next, the next day. And she went to brunch and she said, I'm coming out of the closet. Well, we didn't know what, she, I wasn't there, but Dennis didn't know what she was talking about. And she said she had a secret and she didn't want to keep it anymore. And her secret was that she had been married to Felic and that she was uh, a member of my family. She was in the camp, in the ghetto with them, in the camps, and she knew all the details of our family life. Dennis commissioned someone and did a video uh, with Gutta talking. Gutta survived Auschwitz with help from Danke, because don't forget, Danke had a job indoors. And Gutta and Dora were working very hard outdoors, and it was getting cold, and one day uh, Gutta found some, felt something in her shoulder pad, and she came home at night, she undid it, and it was some jewelry someone had hidden, and she took it to Danka, and a few weeks later, she was called out, and she also got an indoor job. So uh, afterwards, um, she went with her cousin Dora on the death march, and it was very uh, tiring. And she said to them that she couldn't, uh, they couldn't be apart anymore, that they would remain together. Because they were so tired after work, they couldn't talk to each other. So in the concentration, in the uh, DP camp, Gutta and Dora married brothers. And these brothers my father had known. They were brothers to each other. They had lost their whole family. And Dora and Gutta then became sister-in-laws. They were also lifelong best friends. Now, Gutta is still in love with Felic. She still thinks of him. He was her first love, her first lover, her first husband. She says love never dies. She asked her daughter uh, if she could uh, keep a uh, picture of him. And let me show you, this is Gutta. This is Gutta before the war with the hat. That's not her favorite picture. Her favorite picture is her engagement picture. Thanks. This is Gutta with her husband, Lippa. And Lippa is the one who promised her and told her not to talk about Felic. And so she didn't speak about him, even, even uh, to her children or anybody. Uh, I give him some credit. I say, well, maybe he just wanted her to move on with her life. She says he was jealous. And this is Gutta with some of her grandchildren. Her son is Orthodox. So Gutta took her place back in our life. She uh, found us, all of us are her family now. And we found her. It's like having another grandmother. And she just did six hours of testimony for the Shoah Foundation, which we're going, I'm going to see. And she's very proud of herself that she could do it because she said, can you imagine? Uh, she had done it in 1996, but they wanted more testimony from her. And this, because she's from Canada, and now they're integrating all the Canadian testimonies into the ones in um, LA. So uh, I'd like to go back to my theme of love and then talk about survival a little, little bit. And uh, did love prevail? Was it lost in the war? Well, of course it was lost in the war. Uh, Gutta lost Felic. He was the love of her life. Danka lost Sigmund. And they wanted to get married, though, because we all know that during these times, uh, it's important uh, to be together with people, to marry, to feel safe, to feel close to each other. And then it was important to create love again post-war. 
uh, when Gutta and Dora married these brothers in the DP camps, they then had a very strong uh, structural unit. And then love, which is forgotten or repressed, can resurface after many years, as it did with Gutta. She just wanted to get it out. And love of children and, so and new lives sometimes meant not discussing their pasts. Uh, Gutta didn't talk to Tina uh, about this man, uh, but now Tina knows all about him and she accepts him. And so we, we, we see them. I went up in October, last October, to see Gutta. And it's wonderful to uh, see her because she's always telling something new also. Whenever you speak to her, she has another little tidbit to let you know about. So, uh, and I'd like to, say, I'd like to uh, just summarize with uh, survival and how, how these three women made it out. I mean, uh, my grandmother, my grandfather, and the two brothers died, but three women did make it out. Now, Victor Frankel and Primo Levy and Eli Wiesel all agree that luck was a primary factor. The best possibility of living was to spend minimal time in the camps. Life expectancy for working Jew in Auschwitz was only a few months. And my women stayed probably more like uh, 16 months. In Treblinka, life expectancy was just a few hours. So Felik, who was, I said, the hero, he had gone to Bialystok, and he could have stayed there. But he missed his family, he missed Gutta, and he came back. And when he came back and he taught these people to sew on the fur machines, he allowed them to stay after the deportations of 1942, which I've mentioned before. And in 1942, in the summer, there were four phases of deportation from the Warsaw Ghetto. Altogether, they took out 565,000 people. Only uh, 55 to 60 remained. 35 were essential workers, 25 remained illegally. So it really shrunk. And it shrunk into what they called a small ghetto. They moved them to a different area where they had factories. Factories for fur jackets, because they were in Russia. Factories for boots, brush factories. All kinds of factories. People were bribing to get into the factories because even though life was very hard in the factories, you got some food and you were able to stay longer. So uh, the three Berman women, Danka, Gutta, and Cousin Dora, remained alive by going to the camps late because they stayed and they were able to eat in the factory a little bit. And they were relatively healthy and fit for work. And also genetics played a part with Danka because she was so pretty, Mangala called her out of line. Now, I had asked someone, uh, because this was a family story, so I met this woman named Sarah Cushman and she's a PhD in women in the camps. <coughs> and I said, can it be true that Mangala called my aunt out of line? She said, well, Mangala was such a towering figure that after the war some women imagined that they had seen him. And he wasn't even in the camp at that time. She said, but you could tell from your number, from your arm number, if he was there in the camp. So I did have a consultation with her. And Danka had taken her arm number off. And there's a postcard where she says, I'm removing it so I don't have to remember my past. But Gutta had her number. And this woman looked it up. And yes, Mengele was there. And Mengele um, did take her out of the line, because that was his job, to stand there. And um, <clears throat> so there were a lot of uh, stories, as I said. Now, because I showed you such a beautiful picture of Warsaw, I'd like to show you what happened to Warsaw. Warsaw was one of the most destroyed cities in the world. No. Got to push the button? <clears throat> it was bombed by the... Nazis, when they invaded in 1939, then the uprising destroyed it, then the Poles had an uprising, and then the Russians put the cherry on the cake. 
So there was really nothing left. Whatever you see in Warsaw now was completely rebuilt, and then of course the communists came in. So it was never as grand as it was years ago. And I'd like to say, while you're watching this, I'd like to say a few words in conclusion. I'd like to say that uh, Gutta and Dora uh, made new lives for themselves in, in, in Montreal, and I did visit them, but I didn't know who they were exactly. And there were children in cribs. Um, my father said they were cousins, but the story didn't come out until these letters emerged, until Gutta came out of the closet also. Now, for those who didn't survive, those people, I loved meeting them. I loved getting to know my aunt and my uncle and my grandfather. I, I felt like I really uh, met new people. And I was very proud of them as individuals and the way they functioned as a group because they used all their resources. They stayed together. They helped each other inside and from outside, and they were very determined. Now, when you talk about the Holocaust, it wasn't all pleasant. Uh, sometimes I had to push away from it, and I can remember three uh, times exactly. Once I had a letter translated and I was going to, well, it was Staples up here I was always going to, an office depot in Florida, because I go there in the winter, and I was reading the letter, and it was a letter from my parents in 1939, when I was just a baby. And uh, my uh, father was very upset because Warsaw was being bombed. And it just brought tears to my eyes. I was just overwhelmed. That was the only letter that made me cry. Then, when I was on the trip with my cousin Shirley, <coughs> there was a painful revelation. We found out about what happened to my grandmother. And my grandmother didn't go to the concentration camps. One day they were going on the way to work, and she had the family jewelry and papers on her. And she was walking along the street on the way to the Schultz factory, and the Germans called her out of line. And the family said to each other, don't say anything, just keep walking. So they went to work that day, and they came back without her, and they were devastated. <coughs> Another um, thing that was very upsetting was when I read the Nazi, did it end? Yes. So I was reading the Nazi uh, documents about the convoy that my family was in going from Maidanek to uh, Auschwitz. And the way they described them, it's what, sort of what Dan said. You hear about how they objectify people and how they only wanted you if you could work. And in this convoy, they were saying um, how many people had gunshot wounds, some people had hernias, skin infections, some were exhausted, what percent could this, uh, uh, had to be quarantined, and what percent could work. But when I knew that my three relatives were in there, it really hit home. So. Um, even though uh, there were horrific things, uh, for me this was a very positive experience. My family was lost to me, and then they, I found them, and it was a journey of discovery. It was an adventure in time travel. I really went back to another world, another era, and that's how I think of them. I think of them pre-war and together, and the street that they lived on, the parks they walked in, and um, I really appreciate being able to share this with you. It was uh, a very, very uh, meaningful experience. And once I started it, I could not stop. So thank you for coming. And how are we doing on time, Dan? I don't know how to turn this off. Let's turn it. Well, you want to leave this on? Go back to the first slide. OK, go back. OK. Yeah, moderate, yeah. OK. All right, ladies and gentlemen, we have some time for questions. I'd be happy to moderate. Um, you know, raise your hand or something. <laughs> how, how far into the war did this exchange of letters continue? Well, uh, there was only one. Uh, postcard 
from the ghetto. Do, w once they were invaded and once the ghetto was formed, most of the letters are from my father to my aunt in South Africa. And actually, he sent this one postcard to uh, them in South Africa. So the postcard came from the ghetto in 1941. And it's from my uncle Felic. And it made its way to South Africa. What? And it made its way to South Africa because my father, it's addressed to New York, but it wound up in South Africa. So my father must have sent it to his sister because she didn't hear from him. So there are some, you know, and sometimes the front of the envelope, the front is just as important as the back because on the front, he says in this postcard, and that's why I was really became so fond of him. He's very sweet. He says, we got your postcard, but we couldn't have it all for ourselves. We got your food package, but we had to share it, he says. We had to share it with Usher. He says, if you're going to send us another one, please send it to our old address. So that way, ostensibly, he can go and get it and not share it. And on the front, the address says they used to live on Jabovska Street, but now they are living on Marshakovska Street with other families. And he gives the old address on the front. Mm -hmm. And then he asks my father, if it was very expensive, he says, don't send it. Mm -hmm. In the meantime, they're practically starving there. So he's really a very sweet, generous man. But uh, yeah, the mail didn't go back and forth during, during the- packages. Packages, uh, there's, a bu uh, there's a section in my book on the mail. And I want to show you also this book. I found this book. This, this uh, book was very instrumental. And even this is a 900 page book, which we've just purchased for the library here. Uh, it was just translated in 2012 from the Polish. Um, Yale put it out, and now it's out of print. It has everything you want to know about the ghetto. Title? It's called the Warsaw Ghetto Guide to the Parish City. It has maps in the back. It has all the statistics. It was through this book I found out which factory uh, my family lived in. And there's a section in here on the mail, and she says even we don't have that much information. But what she had was very interesting because you could bribe people to get the mail out. You could bribe people to get the mail in. You could, um, sometimes the mailman would come to a building and people had already been taken away and he'd have to read a list to see who was still there. And uh, they talk about there were very few mailboxes and also there was censorship. So they took the mail from the mailboxes, they took them to the Nazis. Some of it got out and some of it didn't get out. When the letters started coming, right. when my cousin sent me the letters, Not before that. I didn't know very much about it, Renee. My, my, my father told me I, know, I knew his, the family was in the Holocaust. I knew his brothers died. I knew his parents died. I knew we had relatives in South Africa, but in, what year was that? in 1930, the letters oh, began. Your interest, yeah. My interest? Yes. Oh, when about six or seven started. years ago about six or seven years ago. It took me about four or five years to uh, translate the letters, another year and a half uh, to put it together and to get more information. It's, it's been a long time, uh, yeah. Rivka is one of my translators. Very helpful. The date range in the book, I go from 1938, the first postcard, and I kind of jump. Uh, there's a letter from my father in 19, it's a very poignant letter in 1940, uh, uh, um, when my father writes to them in the ghetto. And in 43, my father writes, and they're already taken away, and he doesn't know it. 43, and then there's a postcard from uh, my aunt in 49. She writes a postcard. Mm -hmm. Okay, but in terms of the war period, was 40, as recent as 43? 40, 
My father uh, wrote to his uh, sister saying that he had just sent a package to them in Warsaw. It was in the summer of 43, but they were already on the way to the concentration camps. So, so he didn't know. So wait, it actually reached them in, in Warsaw? No, it didn't reach them in Warsaw. It, it was all of the letters were collected by my aunt in South Africa. Even this postcard, which my father must have sent her. And there were, there are 19 in the book. There were about 25 altogether. And I had to keep going because I thought, well, maybe I'll leave something out that, <laughs> a couple of them I didn't put in where they want her to buy some furs on the way to London and some other things. But I finally got all of them translated because I thought best to do that because maybe there would be something in there. And sometimes you had a piece of a letter and then another piece came. Uh, so it, it, it was very interesting. Just uh, Morris was uh, Eva's uncle, yes? Well, I wanted to jump around, but I was afraid. I have to go back to slide number 10. I wanted to jump around, but uh, I'm not so Morris and Eva are brother and sister. I'm not brother and sister, they were cousins. Okay, Morris was in South Africa and he wanted a wife, so Eva went to South Africa. But they were first cousins because his, his mother was David's sister. And in a postcard by Moshe, so it's a very tender postcard, he says, my brother's daughter and my sister's son, you know, are getting married. What joy. And my grandfather is there in Razin, and they are sitting there, they're drinking a, a glass of vodka or something, you know, f for nachas for the wedding. So, and his handwriting is beautiful. <coughs> Jeffrey? Got it. Right. That's why I did this, but it's, it gets to be a little confusing. So um, that's my family. That's my father's family. Where, where was your father born? My father was probably born in Radzin. Some of them were born in Radzin. Most of them were born in Radzin. Mm -hmm. Maybe, I, I think even Felic was born in Radzin. I think they moved to, to Warsaw probably, I, I don't know when, in the late 20s. I couldn't, I couldn't figure it out. Uh, because they, they, you know, they had a quite a, a wide age range. Did he come to the United States? My father, that's another story, it's a love story, because my mother <laughs> went to Poland to, a, um, somebody wanted her to meet someone, mm -hmm. and she went back and she didn't like him. But she went to Warsaw and she saw my father, who was very handsome. Mm -hmm. And my father had seen them beating up the Jews, and my mother was very attractive. She was an American citizen, and he married her. And then she came back, and then he came over here. He came all by himself. We're the only Americans. Nobody else came into the United States. My father was the only male survivor, and he was the only American. And basically, he really sort of looked after the family. A lot of them when did. did uh, about 35, 36. So he escaped yeah, he escaped. He escaped. Okay. So he escaped. He escaped. <laughs> she escaped. He escaped to New York. She escaped to South Africa. So the two of them were a support system for the rest of them. And the ones who got caught was here. The younger one got caught. He went away to Russia. He went to Russia and he came back. But Danka and then her husband Sigmund and Felic and Gutta and Dora and the grandparents, they were the ones that got caught. They were living in the... So Bialystok was in Russia or Poland? It was in the Russian part of Poland, but you could be safe over there. Mm. So this has really been a labor of love. Yes. <laughs> my father, my father, yes. Is he an attorney? No, my husband's an attorney and my son is an attorney, so I'm pretty well represented. <laughs> My father, was, my father was a tailor, like all the rest of the Burmans, and my mother was also in the, uh, you know. Where did, where did they live? Where they lived in New York, we lived oh, in the Bronx, and my mother actually also had 
kind of a support system with her sister. So my mother and my sister lived in the same building. My father sort of got a new family when he came here with my Auntie Anne and my uh, uncle. Uh, and, and, and the children all kind of grew up together. So, so, but my father was always thinking about them. And my father really uh, couldn't uh, give them enough. And so my mother was a very strong woman, very dynamic. And at one point, they didn't have enough. You know, it was, um, it was the Depression, and times were hard. So my father went, and he took out some money from his insurance company. And, and it wasn't until my father died that my mother found out that he took $200 out of his policy so he'd have some money to send to them in Europe. And he was, they were always on his mind. And once they came to Canada, we, we made a lot of trips to Canada, and he, he was really happy, thrilled to see them there. And they also wanted us to come to South Africa because they were rich in South Africa. So, and there's a couple of poignant letters where they're saying, well, maybe you'll come to the United States or maybe we'll go to South Africa. But my mother didn't want to go to South Africa. She told my father that the children were in school and that she liked the United States. And she told him that he could go to South Africa. <laughs> but she was staying here. <laughs> okay, ladies and gentlemen, please join me in thanking Barbara Ruffley one more time. You're invited to come up and look at her artifacts and the other documents we have out in the hall and to join us for the reception. And of course, Kitty will be up here helping you acquire books if you're interested. And thank you so much for joining us at the Kupferberg Holocaust Center. Oh, thank you, Dan.